I'm going to talk to you about a lot of things in as short a space of time as I possibly can. And that is one of the challenges associated with talking about the issues of mental health and mental illness in our society today. It's going to be quite dense. There's a lot in here. But I had to say it because this is an historical event. There are people here today, youth here today, from every part of this province, and that has never happened before. The Premier was here, that has never happened before. This issue has never been where it is right now, and I want to tell you why it's happening. It's happening because of something called cultural change, and that cultural change has begun to engage with the political elements of our society and the organizational elements of our society to allow these things to occur. Let me tell you a bit about myself and I'll explain to you what I mean. My name is Mark Grouchy. I'm a criminal defense attorney in St. John's, pretty well known. I've represented people on everything from murder to shoplifting. I'm 36 years old. I'm the president of the Canadian Mental Health Association, NL, and I have been so for the last six years and I'm the co-chair of the Community Coalition for Mental Health, which is an alliance organization of 36 different groups in the community, mental health and allied related groups, which is affiliated with the very same groups and people like Patrick, the various student coalitions, Patrick's on our steering committee, in fact, who have organized this event. The Community Coalition is historically unprecedented. It never existed before, and it exists because this issue, driven by cultural change, was captured, magnified, and focused by a particular individual named Jerry Rogers, who was a member of the House of Assembly from the NDP. We had a couple of town halls, and it became very apparent that the time was ready for this, and we brought this organization together. And we also, and Jerry in her efforts, and the NDP in particular, prompted the formation of something called an all-party committee, which has also never existed, which now is producing multi-party engagement on the issue of mental health in the legislature going into the future in a way that has never before happened. This is perhaps to you somewhat remote from your daily lives, but it's unprecedented. It's unprecedented and extraordinarily significant because we all share, and in particular to you as young people, a responsibility to continue this change in culture. Who else am I? I have bipolar disorder. Some of you may know what that is. Bipolar disorder is one of the most traditionally so-called serious mental illnesses that exists. It afflicts about 2% of people, but I'm not sure entirely every time if afflicts is the right word. There's about 600,000 of us in this country. In this room of 350 people, there are at least six to seven of you just like me right now. And if you don't know it already, and definitely some of you do, you will eventually. We're not the only group. 1% of the population of this country has schizophrenia. 10% has depression, even more with anxiety disorders. You add up the numbers, you're talking 20 to 25% of the population of Canada at any given point in time has a mental health concern, and this room is no different. It's all throughout this room, it's all throughout our society, it goes right to the top. Right to the top of our society. It's at every level. It's everywhere from our jails to the families of the people who run leaders, who are the leaders of federal political parties. All the way. Everywhere. And for an extremely long time, in this country and in the world, we never talked about it. We never acknowledged it. We never faced it. We never dealt with it. We whispered about it. We put people in facilities that you can properly think of as dungeons today. We have an old dungeon in this province right now called the Waterford Hospital from 1855. We're waiting for it to get replaced. We don't know if it will be, but it has to be. Because it's standing in the way of the implementation of the new understanding of what mental health and mental illness is, something called the recovery model. You may have heard that term, and if you haven't heard it, you're going to. 
It's different from what we call the medical model. It doesn't focus on a person as being diseased. It focuses on a person as being a human being, which is what we have to do. We heard here before I came up, we're all just normal dudes. Well, that's just a relaxed way of saying we're all just human beings. We're all just human beings. And human beings have dignity, and they have worth, and they deserve respect, and they deserve to be treated as such with their autonomy being maximally valued, their self-determination being maximally valued, and whatever they have to contribute being taken in by all of us so that we can all grow as a people. You live in a very exciting time. You may not realize it because you've grown in it and you've seen it, but right now what you are riding on the wave of is a long march of social and historical progress associated with liberating people who were previously perceived as lesser or unequal to their peers. It is still happening. You could argue it starts with women at the turn of the century and continues to this day. It moves to ethnic groups, racial groups. It moves to people with disabilities, physical disabilities, visible illnesses. Today we all know about how a person who has homos who is homosexual, I should say it, I'll make it very clear, it used to be, boys and girls, that a person quote unquote had homosexuality. Did you know that? Once upon a time it was a disease, but it's not a disease, is it? It's a part of who people are. And it was only when we recognized that it was a part of who people are that things got better. I'm not sure if you realize that. But that's the past we're coming from. We know today that the right way to go is to respect the individuality, autonomy, and dignity of every human being. And it's going to be up to you going into the future to make sure that that keeps happening. This isn't just some casual thing that happened that's a fun time and a weekend in St. John's. This is an historically unprecedented event that has come into the existence as a result of the culmination of years and years of work of people decades older than you who are trying to pave the way for you to make the world a better place. I've been involved in mental health advocacy for a decade, ever since I got called to the bar and came back, in fact. Jerry Rogers stepped up. She's been talking to me for years about these issues and eventually she helped operationalize this in a way that we at the Canadian Mental Health Association never could. And here we are today, having this conversation. What does it all mean? What it means is, as we go forward into the future, we need to remember one thing and one thing overall. Just like at the beginning, we're all human beings. It's not just lip service. We all have a right to be who we are. We all have a right to live as we wish, so long as we harm no one else. And we all have a right to be developed to the maximum of our potentials. It's all around you today. Every time you see an issue associated with rights and equality based on sexuality, race, gender, whatever, it's all around you and it's still happening. Don't take it for granted. It doesn't happen by itself. It happens because people like you take it up inside of yourselves and promote it and make it happen. And I'm asking you to help us make it happen. I said earlier, for instance, just one little group, there's at least six people, seven people out there today who either have bipolar disorder or will have bipolar disorder. And if all I achieve in the course of what I am doing, this past four months I've spoke at four schools, I've put 10 years of my life into this, if all I achieve is to convince two of you who are like me to take my place when I'm gone at a podium like this somewhere else saying exactly what I'm saying and beyond and building in all the progress that we have made, I will have done my job. It's time to stand up and be counted. It's time to stop hiding away. It is time to stop simply bowing our heads and believing in the lies 
and the fear-mongering of the media who will focus on some isolated event in some faraway land that may or may not have something to do with a mental health concern so everybody who doesn't know any better can go home and be afraid. We have to fight that fear. We have to fight the fear because it's not real. In this country, in this country you could say, it's about 700,000 people like me with this serious mental health condition, bipolar disorder. One of the most lethal mental health conditions that according to some studies can kill 20 to 30% of the people that have it. It shortens our lifespans. It causes tumult as we transit and as we become adapt to who we are and become functional. There's 350,000 people with schizophrenia, that condition that is so maligned and misunderstood by so many people and associated so unfairly and falsely with so much random violence despite its extreme rarity, meaning the violence itself. And what I want you to consider is if there are 950,000 people in a country like Canada with these two serious, very serious mental illnesses, where are the 950,000 serious crimes? They're not happening. They're not happening because people with these conditions are not criminals. They're people like me. They're professionals. They're politicians. They're you. They're your siblings. They're your parents. They're your teachers. That's who they are. They're all over the television, they're all over the radio, they're the famous people you love and know. They're people like Demi Lovato. Did you know she's bipolar? She has come out at 22 years old and is now an activist for this cause. It is the youngest I've ever heard at a higher level of social awareness that a person has come out and asked for respect and asked for her dignity to be respected. 22 not much older than you. The time is now. The time is now because people have a right to be who they are and they also have a right to get help to become who they are. A lot of people, you know, hear about this thing called stigma. What is stigma? It's bigotry. Stigma is looking at someone and saying, because you are X, you will always be Y. Because you are a woman, you are too emotional. Because you are a woman, you can't play sports. Yes, you can. That's sexism. Because you are black, well, you're just, you're stupid. You're more prone to crime. No, you're not. That's racism. Because you are a gay man, you are effeminate and weak and, and not masculine. Not true at all if you know people who are gay. Not true. People are people, they're diverse. You can't pigeonhole them and judge them by one thing. And stigma says, because Mark's a bipolar, well, you never know what he's gonna do. His mood might just flip any moment now. That's not what happens. There is no button. There is no Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. What you see is what you get. And what you get is a relatively intense, passionate guy who knows how to talk, who's very, very sensitive and highly creative, all of which is associated with my condition well-documented and researched. Why should anybody with any mental health condition have to be judged negatively for the rest of their life? Absolutely evil and wrong. And what I'm gonna ask you as young people who either know people with these conditions or who are dealing with them yourselves, be very careful. Do not take the stigma up into yourself do not believe it. It's not real. When I faced my first diagnosis, when I was 16 years old, when I was 16 years old, just before I got forced out of the school system, I'm a high school dropout, by the way. I very likely would not have been one of the people selected or capable of coming to a mass provincial event like this, because I was barely in school at all when I was 16. And when you go back to your schools, Remember, there's people in your schools who are barely there at all right now. 
And there's reasons why. And we are all responsible for working together and hauling together to make sure that doesn't happen anymore. What it comes down to is this. When they tell you, you are X, you are Y, you have this condition, you have that condition, it can break you. It can make you feel like you are defective, broken goods. It can make you feel like you wish you were never born, like you wish you were somewhere else, someone else doing something else in some other life, in some other body, or in some other skin. But here's the thing. No matter what they say, you're fine. Just the way you are. And you don't need to feel broken, because you're not. Because people like you, with these statuses and these conditions, have always existed. We've always been here, throughout the entirety of human history. And whatever it is we do as individual people, whether we're lawyers or whether we're just someone's good neighbor, or whether we're just somebody you meet walking out of an Atlantic place one day who makes you think about the meaning of life, I have experiences like that with people who unfortunately have to face the scourge of homelessness every day. And many of them have a condition called schizophrenia. And they help me reflect on what it is to be a human being and what the meaning of life is. You know, bag ladies and bag people and all that. You can learn things from them if you pay attention. And you reflect on where you stand and where they are. Perhaps that is their contribution. It's an ecosystem of personality. It takes all kinds to make a world. Everybody has a place and we've always been there. And it's about time that people realize there is no one way. There is no one way to look. There is no one way to uh, love. There is no one way to think. And there is no one way to be. That is what I am saying to you. We have to continue the progress we have made in this area to accept that diversity extends past what has previously been considered so important, but which we realize is so terribly cosmetic and that it goes right to the core of people's right to be who they are. What I'm going to say to you is, is if you're out there today and you're having problems transiting into this, it's not all roses and daisies and honey and light. But what it comes down to is the world has changed and is continuing to change. When I was in school in the late 1990s, I'm 36 years old right now, when I was in school in the late 1990s, there was none of this. There was none of this. There were barely any guidance counselors who knew what any of this was about. I felt like, you know, the encyclopedic resource for bipolar disorder to my guidance counselor in my high school. He meant well, but I had to help him understand me. How ironic is this? You're a teenager and you're dropping out and you're trying to help the school help you. Hopefully that has changed. There were no assemblies like this, let alone, no, no, there were no assemblies within the school, let alone all of the schools. There was no Patrick. There were no visiting dignitaries like Ray Michael right there. There was no coalition. There, there was no care in an open public sense. It did not exist, folks. And it does now. It does now because we're not going back. It has changed. And it's going to keep changing. And it's good for all of us. Because we're all around you. You go through every minute of your day, you heard that figure, 20%. You can't get through your day without interacting with someone with a significant mental health concern at every turn. We are all over the place, all the time. You just can't see us. And it's been that way forever and we haven't been talking. I told you I dropped out of school. Well, that was a horrible experience. I got back through a special program. It was a special private school, if you will, and I say private in the sense it was separate. It was actually government run through an alliance of the College of the North Atlantic and the Waterfront Hospital. It doesn't exist anymore. It slipped back, you see, it got privatized because sometimes when we take our eye off the ball, 
on these issues, it becomes convenient and expedient for the people who make the decisions about this very important social concern to prey on us because we are numerous and divided and afraid to speak. It is only when we speak together as one that they can no longer do that. And then they have to pay attention. And this goes for issues about mental health and it goes for every other social issue you can think of. What I'm talking about is that revolution of identity and human dignity I was talking about a minute ago. You know, sexism, racism, homophobia. Some people call it sanism now when you're talking about mental illness. I don't know if you've ever heard that term before. But the point is, is it's all the same story. No one group, person, or category owns it. And if we don't realize that, if we don't realize we're all hauling together for human dignity, other people will own us. And they'll play divide and conquer. And in 25 years, we'll still be fighting for a proper civilized mental hospital in this province. It has to stop. And it's going to stop with you. Because I know it's not fooling you no more. I will say this. Just about done. I'll let somebody else take over. I think, looking at this from the outside, two issues have been used to define so much of your lives out in the world, in the time you've been on this earth. I remember when September the 11th happened back in 2001. I was in university. What are the two issues? One is what I've been talking about, which is respect for dignity and autonomy of people. That's another way of saying hope. That's another way of saying progress. And what's the other one? It's fear. Every time you turn on the television, there's something to be afraid of, right? Be afraid of this disease somewhere. Be afraid of these people in another country who may or may not like you. Be afraid of this person who has another religion. If you're down in the States, you maybe some people be afraid of gay people. Be afraid of that random person with a mental illness somewhere that may or may not exist who might do something someday and never, it'll never be explained to you and you'll never know, just be afraid. Just go in your house and lock the door. And be afraid and don't talk to anybody and don't join up and don't ally and don't stand up for yourselves and just be afraid. I want you desperately, as you go out in the world and as you age, to really think very, very hard about just who is served by that attitude because it's not us. What serves us is hope, companionship, joining forces, alliances, and standing up and saying, hey, we're human beings. Nobody is harder done by than the next person. Everybody deserves the same equal and fair treatment, and we're gonna get it, and you're gonna give it to us, and we're not gonna stop asking. And that's really, folks, what this is all about. This is a lot more than a health issue. This is a civil rights issue. And I do not want you to lose sight of that in the complexities of this subject. Because yeah, we gotta do a lot of nuts and bolts stuff. And there's lots of breakout sessions, there'll be all sorts of self-care stuff you'll be learning in all this. And you know, I, one of the quotes that was made about this is you don't have to have movie level mental illness to experience, that's for sure. I'll tell you a little story, when I started this, whole thing with my advocacy, and I wasn't even a lawyer yet. I met with a particular lawyer. I told him about my background because I wanted to operationalize it. You see, I wanted to bring my experiences and my identity with bipolar disorder into my practice as a lawyer. Because I believe, truly, and I know, that it helps me represent my clients to the utmost. It helps inform the empathy I have. It helps me understand their plight. There's good in it. There's good in my experience, like there's good in all of yours. And I told the man this, and his response was, well, you know, in a few years, you'll be out working with your colleagues, and you'll, you'll forget all about that period in your life. When you had to drop out of school and all that, you'll forget about that, you'll move on. That's the problem. Some people scratch the surface of the system, they have a little moment, 
They get in trouble for a few months or whatever. It's a very troubling time for them. And then they get out of the system and they find themselves out in the world and they think, wow, that was scary. Don't want to go back to that place no more. That was a really bad place, that psychiatric facility. They had me in for two weeks when I was 22 years old. I'm never going to talk about this again. I'm going to pretend it never happened because people will judge me. They will stigmatize me. I won't get a job. They won't let me in the army. Like Brandon Cooper. You may have heard about him. Gentleman with anxiety who was on the news. Your age. Couldn't get in the army. Fair, right? No. Not right. So people hide away. They don't talk about it and they go about their business. And then what everyone forgets is there are still people in those facilities who don't get out. And it's our responsibility to help them. We can't just walk away and be satisfied with ourselves and be happy with the relative peace in our lives. Because if you, if you heard what I said about that dichotomy between hope and fear, remember something else. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's about the person sitting next to you. If we don't look out for each other, nobody else will. And if you're doing good, you don't sit back and take an easy ride and coast on through. You take whatever resources you got and you pour them into something that helps somebody who's not doing so good. And in the realm of mental health, that means standing up and saying, hey, I remember what that felt like. I remember how I couldn't get services. I remember how I couldn't get a doctor and was waiting forever. I remember how my medication didn't work. I remember this, I remember that. And remember that there are people doing so much worse right now, just down the road, in conditions that you would find horrific. There's a place for things like yoga. There's a place for things like self-help. There's a place like things for having a positive attitude. All of this is important. We have to have these skills, but please do not forget, there are still people in TQ. Total quiet, isolation. Some people call it solitary confinement. They're ill. They need a proper home based on a model that respects their humanity and doesn't treat them like a disease. They need a new approach. They're not going to get it without you. They're not going to get it without you. I'm going to finish with one story. Let me take a minute and I'll be done. When I dropped out of high school and finished in that program that was privatized that I mentioned before, my life was saved by a woman named Donna Kavanaugh, my old high school teacher, who brought me out of the dark, if you will, put me on a course to get my straight A's again and get a scholarship and go off to law school and end up talking to you fine people on a Saturday morning when I would normally be asleep. <laughs> but um, we used to eat lunch in the Waterford. We used to go over there and have our lunch and do our little thing. And there was a place called the Rendezvous, and it's still there. It's where people used to go to smoke and hang out, watch much music and stuff like that. And one day, when I was down in that facility, wearing all my black clothes, with my long hair and my combat boots and everything else that defined me back then at that point in my life, I saw somebody down at the end of the hall about 75 feet away, maybe 50 feet away. It was someone I knew from high school, a girl I went to school with. I kind of knew her, but not super well. I'd forgotten her in the intervening period, like I forgot most of the people I went to high school with, because I wasn't really focused on the social aspects of being in high school, to say the least. There she was, down at the end of the hall in the Waterford. And there I was, and we looked at each other. There we were, together at last, in this hall. And you know what? We never talked to each other. We looked at each other, we held each other's gaze, and that was it, and we never talked to each other. Because people back then just don't like talking to each other in there, I guess. And that's what we had to stop. We had to talk to each other, we had to talk to the world, and we have to remember, when it happens to us, we're not going to walk away. We're going to remember it. And we're going to make the world a better place. We're going to beat the fear. And we're going to keep this march going. And by the time we're all done, everybody's dignity will be respected. That's the goal. I had to say it to you because it's never happened before. 
You'll all go back to your high schools, hopefully with these ideas. And like I said before, if even two of you decided to try to do what we have been doing, people like Jerry, Jerry Rogers, people like me, people like Patrick, that's all we need. We just need a few more people. And I really hope you can help us. And I'd like to say that if there's ever anything I can do for you, professionally or otherwise, to help you, I will. And contact me whenever you would like. And thank you so much for giving me an opportunity to come here and speak to you this morning.